future hope just got disconnected. Uh, I saw that you. they were connected. Hey, Peter, how are you? Oh, future hope. Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Pretty late here. I'm in Boston. Oh, you are. Wow, it is very late. It's um, 2 a.m., isn't it? Yeah, I figured I'd check in for a little bit, see what's going on. Thanks for connecting. Um, and I'm delighted that Future Hope is back today. Um, welcome, all of you. I don't know any of you, I don't know your names yet, but I'm sure soon we'll, we'll get to know your names. Hey, Hunter. That's great. Hunter is back. And Peter, just to, uh, we are recording this session. And I wanted to mention that um, Future Hope is a group, uh, is a school group based in Kolkata in India. Hunter is based on the island of Molokai in Hawaii. Peter's in Boston. Oprajito is in, also in the city of Kolkata in India. And I'm on the big island of Hawaii right now. Nantara is connecting, is originally from Mumbai in India. She's a college student at Harvard, but she's also observing at Keck uh, in Poimea with me. Hi, Anthra. Um, Hi, Raja. Uh, your friends are back from Future Hope. Oprajito and I have been working together with mm -hmm. a research student. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, Yael is connected. Very good. Um, oh, yeah. For the Future Hope group, yesterday, when you Sir, were... we cannot hear you properly. You can't hear me now? Check your audio, because uh, can the others hear me? Antara, can you hear me? Yeah, I can I can hear you fine. Uh, maybe yeah. I'll just put in the chat oh, no. that they should check audio. Yeah. Can you hear us now, Future Hope? Yeah, I hear you. Hunter, you hear us fine, okay. Yeah, yeah I, hear, I hear you fine too. Um, Dale is walking down the stairs, I think. Oh. Okay. I'm just going to make myself dinner while I. It's very late for you. <laughs> 11 o'clock, yeah, wow, that's very late. Is the audio better now at uh, in a future hope? Can you all hear me? I don't think they can hear. They, they could hear us fine. Or oh, who is this creature? There we, go. we got the Hershey. Hershey sighting. Oh. <laughs> Who was your furry friend? That was Hershey. Hershey. What's the name again? Hershey. Like Hershey. Hershey. Oh, you mentioned Hershey, yeah. No. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but I wanted to make sure that. Future Hope, can you guys hear me? Can you all hear me? Oh, okay. Yes. Yes? Yeah, they, they gave a thumbs up. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay. So what I wanted to say is, in the session we did 24 hours ago, sadly, you remember 24 hours ago, we, you were on a session, Child of the Scientist session. You all remember that? You asked excellent questions. Sadly, yes. sadly, I forgot to record that session. Today's session is being recorded. Please do me a favor. When you get some time, before too long, while you still remember what happened yesterday, write down some of the questions and answers, some of the things that you remember from yesterday. Write them in an email. Uh, Ms. Shudata Ma'am can send it to me. If you send it all to her, you can collect all of your responses. I want to some kind of documentation of, of the wonderful session we had um, yesterday. I've asked Yael to write down things. Um, those of us who were there in that first session, please uh, write things down. 
Do you use a Google Doc? Write it in a Google Doc, shared doc. That way, everyone's put your name after the paragraph you write or whatever you whatever you remember. Um, put your name and your class. You don't have to put your full name. You can just put your initials, whatever you feel comfortable writing. But I want a way to document what happened in Shadow the Scientists 24 hours ago in that session. Okay, please help me. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah, you don't have to do it right away, but don't wait too long because then you'll mix it up with what happened in today's session. So try to write down what happened in yesterday's session. Okay, and again, put it in a Google Doc. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Hunter, I've made my plans to visit Molokai again in December. Everything is set. Cool. Look forward to it. Me too. Me too. My family's coming with me that time. Okay. So what we're looking at is a star field here. And we are um, the particular object that uh, Evan and Alessandro are taking spectra of is this galaxy called Barnard's galaxy, NGC 6822. And F means it's the sixth metal plate that they're observing in this galaxy. Uh, these are the coordinates where it's pointed in the sky, um, you know, the RAN deck. Let's see what else. Yesterday we were seeing that, um, um, yeah, this thing, sorry. Um, so that's, that's what Evan and Alessandro are looking at. This is really one of Evan's galaxies. Um, let me see, let me put this bar somewhere else. Soon's um, video fan is getting in the way of my seeing the screen. Okay. Um, we can see that the image quality is quite good. Do you see how the full width half maximum of seeing was at 0.7? This is saying that the air quality above the telescope is quite good. The stars are not too blurry. Uh, They're in fact very sharp. Anything below one is quite good. And you can see for the most part, it's been below one, uh, except for mild excursions, uh, a few excursions too. And that too, it's only gone up to 1.3. It hasn't gone to two or three, anything like that. Uh, and it's really the best it's been, it's around 0.7, which is what it is now. This is time on the x-axis and the y-axis is a measure of how blurry or sharp the stars are. In fact, looking at this image, since I've seen these kinds of images a lot, I can see that the image quality is very good. The images are very sharp. And you can see that six, N6822F is highlighted. That means Evan and Tony, Tony's operating the telescope on the summit. They are, um, um, that, that's the target they're pointed to, uh, pointed at. And uh, let me see, I go to the next window. And this window, you'll see that uh, so far, Earlier in the night, what uh, happened was we first took some, um, they took some sky flats. So this is to like what are called dome flats. Before that, they took some other spectral biases. So they took some kinds of calibration images. Um, these are, you can see these are number 60, 61. 0922 is the date, so September 22. And then this is the 60th, 61st images. So the first 60 images, were calibration images. In fact, the first 60, 76 images were calibration images. Then it went to LVM slit C, that mask with the with the five slits on it. It took spectra of these two RLRI that Yael is going to use for her research and Yael and others. And then um, they aligned NDC 6822F. These are alignment images. And now they're taking the first of the science exposures. So that's in this frame. Now if I go to this frame here, you'll see that um, this is number 81. That means it's actually, let me go back to the log here. Yeah, 81 has already read out. Uh, 80 was the alignment frame, 81 is read out. It's now probably taking frame 82. We can confirm that in a minute, but you can see that 
since 81 is displayed and it shows proper spectra, uh, this is already, you, you can see that in each of these vertical bands, you're seeing, um, within each vertical band, you're seeing a, a white streak. That's a spectrum of the star. That's the light of the star spread out into the colors of the rainbow. So blue light is, lands at the bottom, red light lands at the top. It spreads it out into 8,000 colors. There are 8,000 pixels from the bottom to the top. And this is a silicon device. And you can see, if you go to this frame, you'll see that the current exposure that uh, it's working on is um, 82 because the last CCD file was 81. You see that here where my cursor is. Um, so we're taking data tonight. Um, NGC 6822 is a small galaxy. It's about half the distance between us and Andromeda. And it's not in the direction of Andromeda, but it's closer to us than Andromeda by almost a factor of two. And um, Evan is trying to measure the velocities and chemical composition of stars in that galaxy, part of his research. And now, let me see, there's a message in the chat. Uh, oh, Antara said she'll be back in a few minutes. I think. Now, future hope. This is your fourth night that you're taking part of this. It's fourth afternoon for you, fourth night for me that you're taking part. Is that correct? Any, um, what are your thoughts after? Uh, now that you've seen this for four nights in a row. Boring, interesting, fun, rather eat lunch than watch this. What do you think? Give me your honest opinion of how, what your impressions are so far. I won't be, there's no right or wrong answer. Sorry, the session is interesting. Are you ready to invite some of your friends to this session and explain what you're seeing and what your understanding is of this? Yes. Oh, okay, good. I need you. I need you all to be my, uh, to help introduce other students who haven't had the privilege of watching this for uh, four nights like you have, introducing them to some of these concepts. Um, you see a lot of screens on these. I mean, in fact, there are four different screens, right? There's this one screen that we're looking at now. There's this screen, this screen, this screen, four screens. One, again, one, two, three, four. There's lots of information on these four screens. Um, and of course, many of these things, most of these things are things I haven't explained um, to you. I haven't explained what these numbers mean or what the graph means. Um, feel free to ask questions about those. We are recording these sessions so that um, when you ask the question and someone, one of us answers the question, then um, it helps not only your understanding, but since we are recording it, anyone else watching the recording will also understand. So feel free to ask questions. And this goes for Antara, Aparajito, um, Yael, Hunter, and Peter, of course. I think Peter had to leave. I don't see Peter on the call right now. No, Peter is on the call. And Jim is on the call. Hi, Jim. Yes, please, go ahead. If you want me to display one of the other screens, I can do that. Again, this is screen one, screen two. Actually, it's called control zero. If you look at the top, it says control zero. The next one says control one. Next one says control two. And the last one is called tell status, telescope status. Answer, I have a question. Yes, please. On the, left, on the left side, there are showing some names and uh, and the numbers. What's that? Do you mean these these numbers and names? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 
Very good. Okay. So what is this is something called a star list. You'll see it says OA star list. OA stands for observing assistant. Uh, that's tonight that's referring to Tony, who's on the mountain controlling the telescope. He's a, we are the observers, and he's the observing assistant. He's helping us observe. Now, um, index is just the row number, of course. Uh, sorry, yeah, row number. Name is the name of the object in the sky that we want to observe. So in some cases, it's simple. Like if we were to scroll down, I can't scroll down because I'm in view-only mode, but um, uh, NGC 6822, uh, N 6822, abbreviated uh, for N abbreviation for NGC 6822, is the name of a galaxy. And as we um, as we discussed yesterday, E and F are two different metal plates that observe different stars within that galaxy. And you notice they have slightly different coordinates because they are observing slightly different parts of that galaxy. They're similar but not identical. 1944, 1945. Now, um, give me a moment. I have to. Um, I'll, I'll continue the explanation. Just a moment. I have to finish something here that's come up. Okay, I'm done, um, sorry. So then the next two columns of numbers are like the longitude and latitude, but they're referred to as RA. RA stands for right ascension and DEC stands for declination. It says RA slash as DEC slash L, E-L. That in other words, instead of giving RA and uh, deck, you can also give something called azimuth and elevation, which are sort of telescope coordinates rather than sky coordinates. Um, equinox is the year, year 2000.00, is when these coordinates were defined because the Earth's axis, this is a coordinate system that's based on the equator, poles, based on the Earth's axis. And since the Earth's axis is changing its orientation very slowly on a, over a period of 26,000 years, Whenever you specify the coordinates of a star, you have to specify where the Earth's, you know, what the orientation of the Earth's axis was at the time you define the coordinates. And so this refers to where the Earth's axis was pointed 22 years ago in 2000. When I was in graduate school, we used to use 1950 coordinates. Then we started using 2000 coordinates. Later, we used some other coordinate system. Uh, no, it's the same system, but it refers to how the Earth's axis is pointed. Mag column, you see these are blank or zeros. This tells you how bright the object is. And if this object is a moving object, not steady, then PM stands for a proper motion in RA and DEC and so on. Those are, does that help explain what these numbers are? It's a long answer to your question. You feel yes, like sir, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for asking. Uh, Hunter. Yeah, Hunter, go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to take a question for Hunter, then I'll come back to future. Hope. Just a moment. Go ahead, Hunter. Um, so for the spectrum screen, what what is the uh, the spectrum of the starlight tell you about the star? These uh, these white vertical streaks, if um, if we measure intensity as a function of wavelength. One of the things we can learn, that there are three or four things we can learn very easily. One thing is we can learn what, whether, whether it's a star at all or a background galaxy, sort of what kind of object is it? What type of star, roughly, whether it's a star or a galaxy or a quasar, we can learn those things. We can, if it is a star, we can learn something about the temperature of the star. We can learn about how fast the star is moving towards or away from us. And we can learn about its chemical composition. These are a few things we can learn from the spectrum. Does that answer your question, Hunter? Uh, no. Yes, thank you. And, and we can't tell those things just by looking. We have to, uh, this is why we have to first remove the effects of the Earth's atmosphere. Those are these horizontal streaks that are produced by the Earth's atmosphere. We have to reduce, 
we have to remove that. In other words, this telescope is looking through the Earth's atmosphere and collecting the glow from the Earth's atmosphere in addition to collecting the glow from the star. So we have to remove the effects of the Earth's atmosphere. We have to remove the effects of the instrument, the silicon detector and the glass. So we have to sort of calibrate or remove the effects of the instrument. We have to remove the effects of the Earth's atmosphere or calibrate it out. Then we can analyze that these faint vertical streaks, like my cursor is going along one of them, um, the, uh, the detailed pattern of intensity as a function of wavelength, wavelength runs from, uh, from low wavelength at the bottom to high wavelength at the top. Really careful analysis of that light intensity as a function of wavelength can tell us all those things. Is it a star, a galaxy, or a quasar? First question. If it's a star, what is its temperature, roughly? What is its velocity in kilometers per second? Uh, and uh, with even more analysis, what is its chemical composition? So that's a detailed answer to your question, Hunter. Yeah. Welcome Hi. back, Jim. Good, good to see you. Oh, we also have the question in the chat. Let me look up the question in the chat. Sorry. You know, that's a great question, Jim. Jim has asked why didn't they continue to use 1950 coordinates? Um, so the actual coordinates we're gonna to use tonight are 2022 point, whatever September 21st corresponds to, which is 2022.7 something, 0.8. Um, and it so happens that the 20, 2000 coordinates are not that far off from 2022, but they're much further off from 1950. So intuitively, people found it useful to use a reference year that was closer to the year in which they were actually using the telescope. That's become less and less uh, meaningful. I, for example, I carry around in my head what the coordinates of Andromeda are, but I carry around in my head what the 2000 coordinates are. And if I were a creature living in 3000 AD, carrying that information is not as helpful because if someone tells me that the current coordinates of Andromeda is this, uh, or if someone tells me the current coordinates of something is this, I wouldn't know whether it's near Andromeda or not because I'm stuck with. And that's sort of why people kept refining these systems so they could keep memorizing coordinates in a system closer to the current coordinates. Exposure. Practical reasons, really, nothing, nothing hard and fast, but just practical reasons to uh, so that people could use their memory of coordinates to do things. It's, it's very hard to do the conversion from 1950 coordinates to say 2022.8 coordinates in one's head. I don't know of anyone who can do that. Jim, where are you located um, right now? Are you in California? Yes, I'm I'm in Huntington Beach. Oh, yes, you mentioned that. Okay, okay. That's quite late for you. I'm cl getting close to midnight, 11.30. Yeah, a little bit. And you haven't met our wonderful students from Kolkata, India, from Future Hope. Can you uh, read readout? No. Please. This is the fourth night in a row that they've connected, the 25 students in the classroom, and we've had very, very good questions. Isn't that something that we can connect with people yeah. from India? And... That's right, and operative is also in India. Let's see, but does, doesn't that mean that essentially all coordinates have an extra dimension value? Uh, yeah, they do. There is a time component to it. So the coordinates don't have a time component to them. Here's, let me explain it in the following way. If you, we use a cord, the, our fault is we use a coordinate system that's locked to the axis of the earth. That's our problem. And this axis of this uh, planet we live on wobbles on a 26,000 year time scale. Uh, you know, it, it sweeps out a cone on a 26,000 year time scale. 26,000 years doesn't seem a long time, but you know, it makes enough of a change even in a hundred years or 50 years that um, that's really the issue. That is, we've locked our coordinate system onto the Earth's equator and pole, which are intrinsically 
a dynamic coordinate system that uh, Earth, even, even if the stars were not moving or changing at all, the Earth's axis slowly would not be pointed at the pole star in a few thousand years and so on. And if we, you know, and people do use galactic coordinate systems that are tied to the Milky Way galaxy, the poles and equator of the Milky Way galaxy are not changing as rapidly. And so in a way, that's a much longer term coordinate system. Or if one were using ecliptic coordinates, which yeah, that's that's what I was wondering. I was surprised that an invariant coordinate system wasn't used, and then just apply a transform, yeah. um, you For know, even program that into the telescope so that you could put in the you know unchanging oh. coordinates and it would adjust. Yeah. So the thing is, now we have smart computers and they can adjust. But it makes sense why people had coordinate system tied to the Earth because. That's what the, that's the platform we are observing from. Um, it, it was important to know if what star would be overhead, et cetera. But um, you know, in certain branches of astronomy, you use L and B, latitude and uh, longitude, based on the galactic system, galactic coordinate system. Um, in some branches, you use um, you know, if you're studying the structure of galaxies in the local supercluster, you might use supergalactic coordinate system. That's based on the supercluster, not not the Milky Way galaxy itself. Uh, people use people who study solar system science use ecliptic coordinates. Ecliptic meaning the plane of the uh, plane of the solar system, the main plane that the planets go on. That has a declination of that has a latitude of zero, and the perpendicular to that is uh, latitude of ninety and minus ninety. So people use different coordinate systems. Uh, they do. Uh, those are called ecliptic coordinates, coordinates that are tied to the plane of the solar system. Now, Pluto isn't in that plane. Pluto is pretty far out of that plane, but most planets are in that plane. GCD readout complete. And, you know, several comets. Things that come from far away are often not in that plane. But uh, all the inner planets and so are, are very closely tied to that plane because that plane is the debris of material that was around the sun when it was forming. So it has a memory of the angular momentum vector of the material that formed the solar system, the spin sense of the material that formed the solar system. That would be a natural coordinate system. But you know, this discussion we're having about coordinate systems is just highlights how complicated it is to keep track of things, even to keep track of their positions is not, not simple. I, I don't mean to scare away a, a child who's interested in science from this, but I found studying spherical uh, trigonometry quite difficult. Um, and I still have to draw pictures and so on when I'm trying to understand. Uh, complete. Even something simple like Tonight, the moon is a first quarter moon. Someone tells me that. Is the moon going to be up during the first half of the night or the second half of the night? I have to draw a picture each time to, to figure out which. I should know this by now, but I don't memorize it. I reason through it, and I have to draw a picture for it. I know that if the moon is full, then it's going to be up all night because it's always opposite. A full moon is directly opposite the sun. So a full moon means it will be up all night, and a new moon means it won't be up at night. It'll basically be in the direction of the sun. But when it comes to first quarter moon, I know it will be up for half the night, but I have to draw a diagram to convince myself whether it's the first half of the night or the second half of the night. And of course, if, if the uh, first quarter moon is up during the first half of the night, the third quarter moon would be up for the second half of the moon. That much logic I can apply. And these are practical questions for me as an astronomer to know whether you know, what, what coordinates, what, what objects in the sky I can observe when in the year and which nights and what moon phase. These are, these are planning exercises we have to go through when we write a proposal. Did By the way, out complete. today, of course, is the um, autumnal equinox in the Northern Hemisphere. And um, tomorrow, September 22nd, 5 p.m. Pacific, is the deadline for astronomers in the University of California system to submit proposals to use the Keck telescope for the first half of 2023. So we're putting in a proposal in September, it'll get judged by a committee of fellow astronomers 
and they will decide which which of these proposals merit getting time on the telescope or not. And the slot of time, the six months during which they'll assign us time is from February 1st of 2023 to July 31st of 2023, those six months, not January 1st to June 30th, but February 1st to July uh, 31st. So I'm excited, I'm part of two proposals that are going in and um, one is to use an instrument called KCWI, an integral field unit. And uh, one is to use uh, the spectrograph called ESI, a shell spectrograph and imager. The deadline for proposals for the Lick telescope, the three meter telescope, a little bit later in the, um, it's a month later. And other telescopes uh, proposals are due at different times. But tomorrow is for the uh, UC, University of California share of Keck time. Two proposals are going in. I think asking for, I think one is asking for three nights, one is asking for two or three nights. When do you find out if you're accepted? So um, for a while there, I was serving on the time allocation committee or I was helping the time allocation committee with scheduling. So I would get inside information early, at least uh, as to how proposals were ranked. Um, and I went by ranks to schedule the telescope. So I knew um, before others knew what, uh, who was gonna get time and when. Uh, I'm, I no longer serve that function. I have plenty of other things to keep me busy. So I'll find out when everyone else finds out and that will be in early November. So about two months before the actual observing semester start, that's, you know, practically that means you can book airline tickets and make lodging and bookings if you're going to travel to the telescope. Future hope your uh, you are unusually quiet today. What has happened? Has someone scolded you or what has happened? Hello sir, I have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, how do you decide a name of a star? I mean, you also give numbers to uh, numbers for stars. So how do you decide the name or the numbers? What's the procedure? Do you see the characteristics of the stars or position or what? That's a very good question. Um, the answer is all of the above, right? So certain stars are named based on their properties and type. Um, you know, for example, if you find a a white dwarf star, you may give it a name that has WD at the beginning, find a neutron star, you might put NS at the beginning. So some objects are named based on what kind of object they are, what kind of star or quasar they are, or galaxy. Um, the other way in which some things are named is they're named after discoverers. So there are asteroids that are named after people who discovered them. There are, uh, you know, this galaxy that um, Evan is looking at now, it has an NGC number, but it's also called Barnard's galaxy because Barnard was one of the people who studied it. And, um, you know, his studies became, made that galaxy well known and he became famous for it. But the International Astronomical Union, IAU, which is a, a, a governing body for astronomical science and education, they have a system that says that you take the detailed um, longitude and latitude, and you embed that into the name. So it's a string of numbers that tell you where in the sky the object is located. So if you, in a, if you do a Google search for, I'll uh, put this in the chat, IAU naming convention. IAU stands for International Astronomical Union and naming convention. That will begin to give you the answer to your question of how, how the IAU recommends that objects get named when they're discovered. Does that help to answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, sir, I have, I have so please do a search. I'm going to put this in the chat. Sorry. Um, please uh, do a search for IAU naming convention like that. Uh, you, did you say you have another question? Yes, I have. A. Sir, I want to ask that the positions of, positions of the star is fixed or they all stars move? 
That's a very, very good question. Um, stars move by a very subtle amount. And sometimes it takes measurements that are 10 years apart in order to see any appreciable change in position. The stars are very far away from us. Um, so for the most part, during a human lifetime using normal instruments, star positions can be thought of as practically fixed. Um, they do move because star, and they do appear to move because the Earth that we are observing from is moving around the sun. So stars, nearby stars undergo an apparent wobble. In other words, if I move my head from side to side like this, like I'm doing now, my laptop screen looks like it's moving equal and opposite to the wall in the room. So things that are far away, if you use that as reference and you move your head from side to side, you'll see that the your whatever something that's right in front of you, like my laptop screen, will look like it's doing the equal and opposite motion. So the Earth's motion around the sun causes nearby stars to do an equal and opposite wobble relative to much more distant stars, okay? That phenomenon is called parallax, P-A-R-A-L-L-A-X, like parallel, but instead of E-L at the end, A-X. Parallax is the apparent motion of nearby stars because of the Earth's motion around the Earth. I'm oh, sorry, Earth's motion around the sun. And then in addition to that, stars, of course, are also moving. And so sometimes we can, if it's a nearby star that's moving quite rapidly, we can detect its movement relative to more distant stars. And there it's not a wobble equal and opposite to the Earth, but it's you know linear, it's moving in, in a straight line rather than wobbling. The wobble that we see as, um, how often does that wobble repeat when we see a wobble that's in response to the Earth's motion around the sun? How, how often do you think that wobble repeats? Um, when we see, if we see a star that appears to wobble equal and opposite, uh, to the uh, Earth's motion around the sun, how often does it repeat the wobble, do you think? Once every month, once every 10 years, what do you think? How often does the Earth go, how long does it take the Earth to go once around the sun? 365 and a quarter days or one year, right? So if you see a star that's appearing to wobble, uh, equal and opposite, and its wobble period is 365 and a quarter days, you know that it's doing that because of the Earth's movement. And from that, you can determine how far away the, um, the star is. The closer it is, the bigger the wobble. Further away it is, the smaller the wobble induced by the Earth's motion. Apparent wobble, it's not a real wobble. Is that odd? Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have a one more question for you. Yeah, please, please. Sir, uh, I have I have read that the uh, the one moon of Jupiter, uh, named Europa, it's a habitable it's a habitable place, but it's a moon. Jupiter, Europa is a moon. But how it's habitable? How can a moon is habitable? So when people talk about a habitable zone, so uh, Jupiter indeed has many moons: Callisto, Europa, Ganymede. It has many moons, but. When people say Europa is habitable, that means its distance uh, from the sun is such that, you know, the temperatures are not too hot, not too cold. Um, again, I don't think Europa is habitable because it must be much colder than the Earth, even colder than Mars. So I don't see how, Jup how Europa could be habitable unless it has a lot of internal volcanism and heat sources, which we know that some moons have. Titan, for example, has uh, Io, Titan, these have volcanoes on them. That means they have internal heat sources. So when people talk about habitable zones, habitable regions, they're often merely talking about temperature, not necessarily about the properties of the atmosphere and those things. They're really talking about temperature. But the temperature is in, a re in the range that we experience here on Earth. Also, you know that there's so much information on the internet, not all of it is accurate, not all of it is carefully researched. So that's something to be careful about also. Okay, people think there's a subsurface ocean on Europa. 
Which is how it could maybe be warm. Yeah, Jim, I don't know if it's a volcanic ocean, in which case that could be pro providing a source of heat. I'm, I'm looking it up on Wikipedia. Very good. Very Some good. Says consensus is a layer of liquid water exists beneath Europa's surface. Heat okay. from tidal flexing allows the subsurface ocean to remain liquid. I see. What does it say yeah. the temperature on the surface of Europa is? Does it say that? Surface is uh, 110 Kelvin. That's certainly so not that habitable. Surface, yeah, no, but the, the, the theory is that there's liquid water, a liquid ocean under inside and from the tidal force from Jupiter, mm -hmm. keep, keeps it melted. Yeah. So if it's a kind of like we have thing, a mantle. Yeah, that's the thing about the uh, moons of Jupiter. Um, they have the huge advantage of the being moons of Jupiter and the tidal force kind of like produces enough energy that it can uh, keep the water liquid and probably at high enough temperatures at, you know, depths. Uh, 100 and, 110 Kelvin is minus 173 Celsius. But that's, the, that's the surface temperature though. I mean, yeah. uh, what Jim is talking about are subsurface oceans. Okay. So it will be under the ice sheet and it will simply stay liquid due to the uh, pulling of Jupiter uh, on tidal, the tidal yeah. effects of Jupiter. Yeah, kind of like there's liquid rock inside the Earth, but yes, not generally at the surface. Not at the exactly. surface. That's right. Um, so I wouldn't call Europa habitable then. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, I do want to point out that whenever you hear about a planet or a moon or anything being habitable, uh, it's always like, um, you know, within a huge, huge margin of error. Um, because no place anywhere is as habitable as our planet Earth, uh, you know, at least for humans. For our um, life form, so, yeah, for our life form. Yeah, I mean, people talk about settling on Mars, people talk about building colonies uh, on Mars, but, Mars is absolutely inhospitable. Like no matter what any billionaire says, <laughs> it's absolutely a terrible, terrible place to live in. Uh, I mean, sure, we can go there, do some science and maybe try to get back. I mean, hopefully get back, obviously. But to go and permanently live there and call it our second home, I mean, that's still like very, very, very far. And um, honestly, I mean, if we can terraform Mars and make it habitable, then we might as well fix our own planet and uh, fix the effects of climate change. So no. yeah, I mean, whenever we talk about habitable planets, we should always remember that nothing will ever be as habitable as that. Good point, these are good points. Um, it just struck me, we when we were talking to Future Hope the other day, you issued a very kind invitation to me to come and visit your school. And I will definitely take you up on that. But one person who is able to visit your school before I can, possibly, is Opera Jito. And one of the other students in Kolkata, Monjima. So maybe they can come and visit the, your school before I am able to. Yeah, absolutely. I can try. Aparajita's college and Manjima's college is not far, or the college they used to go to is not very far from where your school is located. Their homes are quite far away, but where they used to go to college is not that far away. Let's see what's going on with Keck. So they're on a different galaxy and 18A, which is one of the small galaxies behind Andromeda. And it's about less than halfway through, 39% of the way through a half hour exposure. So less than 15 minutes into a half hour exposure. Actually just over 11 minutes into a half hour exposure. And um, 
you may remember an 18A from yesterday, because Helen was observing that uh, yesterday as well. These stars are quite faint, so it takes many hours of um, spectroscopic, uh, of gathering spectra with the world's most powerful spectroscopic telescope, um, Keck, uh, to get meaningful measurements. So that's why um, this is the fourth night in a row, and each night he's taking, um, he's observing Andromeda 18 for two and a half hours, one set of stars for two and a half hours, and that's on an 18A. And if we go to this screen, you'll see that he's also got something called an 18B, which is, you know, index number four. He's been spending two and a half hours on each of these two sets of stars in AND18. He's been the fourth night in a row. He's doing this. At the end of it, how many hours of exposure time will he have on these stars in AND18? Again, one set of stars he's observing for two and a half hours uh, for each of four nights. And the other set of stars he's observing for also for two and a half hours per night for each of four nights. So these stars in Andromeda 18, how many hours of exposure will you have uh, at the end of these four nights? What is two and a half multiplied by four? Anyone? Future hope? Hello, sir. I have a question. You have to answer my question first. Um, if Andromeda 18 is being observed for two and a half hours each night for four hours, uh, for four nights, how many hours will it be observed for? What is two and a half multiplied by four? Hunter, you had your hand up. Can you please repeat the question? Two and a half hours per night multiplied by four nights. How many hours? Seven. How much? Two and a half Nine. hours per night. Multiple Nine. 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 Ten. Ten hours. That's right. Ten. Ten. Imagine taking your camera and pointing it at one thing for 10 hours. You'd get you'd be able to see very, very faint stars especially if you think this camera is 10 meters in size, you know, the mirror is 10 meters in size. So um, that's how difficult these observations are. It takes 10 hours on the world's most powerful spectrograph and telescope combination to get a meaningful spectrum. Uh, so this came from future. Say that again, please. This came from future. Hi, Prem. How are you? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. The camera you use, is it a charge couple device camera? The camera is a charge couple device camera. Let me show you a picture um, that is taken with that camera. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but in um, it is indeed a charge couple device camera. Um, but when this exposure reads out, it will be a little easier to see it. Um, it is. Um, not a single charge couple device, but it's a set of eight. It's um, okay. there's two rows of they're called CCDs, charge couple device. There's a row of four yeah. CCDs in the top row and four more in the bottom row. And each CCD is 2000 by 4000 pixels, so eight megapixels. And uh, there's eight of these. Uh, eight megapixels is each CCD, and there's eight of them. Remember, two rows of four each. So it's a 64 megapixel camera um, that okay. is collecting the spectrum. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, I have a question. Yeah, please, please. Sir, as you said, uh, for recording, I mean, for observing a star, we need to put the microscope, um, sorry, telescope uh, in a opposite rotation to the Earth because that will show the fixed uh, direction of the star. Yes. So is a person required to stay for the, for 10 years, uh, 10 hours? Uh, uh, it is automatic. It's automatic. It's certainly automatic. And um, also, these 10 hours were not at one go. Remember, it's two and a half hours per night. So for these two and a half hours, 
indeed the telescope has to keep pointing at the same star. And we have an elaborate system that makes that happen automatically. That's shown over here. This camera that you see here is called the guider camera. You see the word guider on top um, and magic is an acronym. Um, IQ stands for image quality, M stands for guider, uh, A stands for acquisition, guiding and image quality. I forget what M stands for. But anyway, it says guider. This is a small camera that's connected to the Keck telescope. And the way we ensure that the telescope is moving exactly equal and opposite to the Earth's rotation is by taking this star that you see a box around and making sure it's light lands on exactly the same set of pixels. One second, after the next, after the next. It literally takes a new image of this star every one second, and it makes sure that it's pixels, that the light that's falling hasn't drifted in terms of which pixels it's landing on. If it drifts to the right, then you know the telescope has drifted too far left, so then it quickly nudges the telescope to the right, and so, it makes corrections every one second, very fine corrections as needed to keep the star frozen. So it's not done by a human, it's done automatically by software and this system. That's a great question. I hope I, I hope I answered it. Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, as we know, sir, different, different planets have different number of moons. So what if uh, what if we add another moon to the Earth? What, how will it affect our Earth? You know, I don't know how that would affect the Earth, but I do know that these are birth conditions of the planets and the moons around them. They're birth conditions in the sense that these happened a long time ago. When the Earth was forming is when it's thought uh, the moon formed approximately then. It might have been through an impact, something impacted the Earth and a piece that was originally part of the Earth may have become separated from it. But these are formation from a long time ago. It's not like planets are being captured constantly. Sorry, it's not like moons are constantly being captured by planets. So, I understand your hypothetical question of what would happen if a new moon were, uh, not a new moon, new moon means something else, a second moon were added to the earth. It depends on how it were added. If it were added by, if something just fell into the earth and you know fell into a perfect orbit like that, uh, that would have one kind of consequence. If it came in on a highly plunging orbit, it would have a different kind of consequence. So, um, there's not an easy way to answer your question. I do know that if the, the Earth acquired another moon whose orbital radius was comparable to that of our current moon, that would perturb the uh, system. On the other hand, if the orbit were much smaller or bigger than the moon's current moon's orbit, then it will have a minimal effect on the Earth-Moon dynamics. But it's a hypothetical question because we don't think this is going to happen. And we don't think that's how planets, uh, you know, this is not why Jupiter has many planets, it, they, not because it kept gathering new planets from other, not Jupiter has a lot of moons, not because it kept gathering moons from other planets, but because that's how it was formed. Or that's how it, these things happened very early in Jupiter's history. It's a wonderful uh, hypothetical question. I, I hope I've uh, tried to answer, uh, I've done my best to try to answer them. You guys are asking very good questions that are, that I hope you will study one day as you uh, become scientists. I want to do a quick time check. We're um, just an hour into the Shadow the Scientist session. And, um, Again, remember um, for the future hope students who were part of the session at 24 hours ago, remember to create a Google doc and write down some of the questions and topics we discussed yesterday, because that's a session I forgot to record, uh, my fault. And um, that way we can document what was discussed for the benefit of 
just for us to remember and for other people who are curious, what did you discuss on September 20th? They would be able to look at that. Just like for 21st, we are recording and they'd be able to watch the video. But for the 20th, I'd love to have a written doc. Sir, Sorry, I'll go back to the graph. These two graphs in red. Did you mean these two graphs in red? Yes. Upper one or lower one? You mean the upper graph or the lower graph? Both. Both. Okay. Um, so the lower graph is uh, so in both cases there's time on the x-axis and this is time being counted in military time you can see 2055 means 855 p.m h s t stands for hawaii standard time um, so you can see both of them have um, time uh, you'll notice that the points keep shifting to the left because it's keeping, it's a running graph, meaning it's current, it's a current graph. Soon, you know, 2050 has appeared here, 2055 has appeared here soon. In just a few minutes, in a minute or two, you'll see 2100 will appear on the right because it's about to turn, uh, it's about to be, uh, what is 21, nine o'clock over here, um, midnight in California and 1234 you in Kolkata. So um, you see 2100 has just appeared here. So time is running on the x-axis. What is on the y-axis is a measure of how sharp the stellar images are. The smaller the number, the sharper the image. The way this is measured is if you, uh, next time when you go out and you see the moon, you'll find that if you hold out your thumb at arm's length, the width of your thumb, apparent width of your thumb held at arm's length is twice the diameter of the moon. Okay, you can try that. Don't do that for the sun because the sun has got such a glare that it could hurt your eyes. But for the full moon, the sun also has an apparent diameter of half a degree. And your thumb held at arm's length has an apparent diameter of about one degree. Okay, again, the thumb held at arm's length, the angle it presents to your eyes is about one degree and the full moon and the sun's diameter about half a degree. Um, do you know what one degree is? Do you know what 90 degrees is? We have another name for 90 degrees. What is it called? What is another name for 90 degrees? Right angle. Very good. In other words, if you take your thumb and hold it directly out in front of you and then try to step it across by one and one and one, if you do this 90 times, your arm should trace out a right angle. You can try this. Okay, don't do it right now because taking 90 precise steps, and it has to be precise, meaning where you want to move your thumb by exactly one width, one width, one width. It, you'd have to take 90 of these steps to go from your arm pointing straight out in front of you to your arm pointing out to the right if you're doing this with your right hand. You can oh, what is that? Sorry? Yes. I didn't understand. Say that again, please. I didn't understand what you were asking. Go ahead. Okay. So now you know what a degree is, right? 
you maybe you always knew what a degree is. It's one ninetieth of a right angle. Okay. How many degrees are there in a full circle? Three sixty. Okay. So one way of thinking of a degree is one three hundred and sixtieth of a full circle. Okay. So in other words, if uh, when you look at the sun, it doesn't obviously it doesn't cover our full sky. If it did, that would be 180 degrees, because uh, that's how much of the sky we can see at any given time, horizon to horizon. Um, and the sun only occupies half a degree. Its diameter is half a degree. Same for the full moon. Now, uh, what do we call when you take a degree and you divide it into 60 parts? Do you know what you call that unit? Minute. Very good. It's called an arc minute. What happens if you take an hour? What happens if you take a day and divide it into 24 parts? What do you get? One hour. One hour. Okay. And then if you divide an hour into 60 parts, what do you get? One minute. One minute. Okay. In the same way, if you divide a degree into 60 parts, it's called an arc minute. If you divide an arc minute into 60 parts, it's called an arc second. Just like if you divide a minute into 60 parts, it's called a second. So the y-axis of the lower graph is telling you how um, big a star appears to be for us due to the turbulence by the Earth's atmosphere. And you can see that it's less than one arc second. It's maybe 0.7 or 0.75 arc seconds right now, 0.8. 0.8 arc seconds right now. That's what the graph is telling us. Now, isn't it interesting that the same names that we use to divide time are not the word hour, but the fact that we use minute to refer to 1 60th of an hour. It's the same unit we use for angle, same name we use for the unit. So if you divide a degree into, once, uh, into 60 parts, each part is called an arc minute. And then if you divide an arc minute into 60 parts, each one is called an arc second, just like every minute is divided into 60 seconds. So do you know where the name minute comes from? Yes. No? What is the word minute? If you just put minute into a Google search, the word M-I-N-U-T-E has a meaning in English. Two meanings. You could say, give me a minute, but you could also say, um, no, it, it, it means moment or it means a unit of time. But if I said that, if I said that that hummingbird is a minute creature. M-I-N-U-T-E, same word, right? Small. It means small, small. So minute means small, and that's why it's called a minute. It's a small part of an hour, or a small part of a degree. That's why it's called a, a minute, okay? That's why it's not pronounced the same way. It's not called an arc minute. It's called an arc minute, but the origin is the same. It's a small part, okay? Now... Why do you think it's called a second? Yeah. Why is it? Why do you think it's called a second? Are you going to answer that? It means read out complete. Sorry. By the way, you, uh, yeah. Did you say you had a question? Yes, sir. What made you to be an astronaut? Astronomer? I will answer that. But first, tell me why you think a second is called a second. We decided that a minute is called a minute because it's a small part of a, an hour or a degree. Why is it called a second? Most of my students have told them the answer to this. So answer, uh, you may know this answer. It's smaller than a minute. You're onto something. Why is it called a second though? Sir, second part of the hour. 
very good. It's the second time you divide the hour. The first time you divide into 60 parts, it's called a minute. The, uh, the first time you divide it. So in Latin, it was called the first minutum, which means the first division of the hour. What we today call a minute, give me a minute, give me five minutes. But in Latin used to be called first minutum, which means the first division of the hour. Then the second time you divide that, when, you divide, uh, when you divide the unit a second time, that is, you take a minute and divide it into 60 parts, it was called the second minutum. In Latin, in Newton's Principia, which is a book about mechanics, he even refers to a unit of time called the third minutum. What do you think a third minutum is? How would you write a third minutum? If you were to explain that to someone, how would you explain a third minutum? What do you think it is? Can you guess? What do you think a third minutum is? Again, the first minutum is what we call a minute, one sixtieth of an hour. So the second minutum, which we call the second, is one sixtieth of a minute. What do you think a third minutum was that Newton was referring to? Anyone? It's a millisecond. Not a millisecond, no. Excellent. Excellent. What, sorry? It's a fractional second. What fraction of a second? Third minutum. What was you dividing by each time when you went from 60? When you went to the first minutum, what were you dividing an hour by? What number? 60. For 60, you were dividing 60. 60. Yeah. So the third minutum is 1 60th of a second. Newton actually refers to that. And today we understand that it means 1 60th of a second. <coughs> Sorry. What made you become an astronomer? Huh? Wow. Um, Jim, I'm reading what you wrote me. That's very interesting. Um, Feel free to share it widely, um, you know, the Wikipedia page. That's very interesting. I'm, I clearly am not a planetary scientist and I haven't studied um, how uh, moons of planets have formed, but this is very interesting. Thank you for it. Thank you for it. Thank you, Malay. So it looks like it has two flavors of moons. Sir, can you repeat your question? No, no, I wasn't asking a question. I was just asking Jim to share what he found about the moons of Jupiter. Very interesting. Um, yeah, one, before uh, that quote, it says that the larger moons are in the ecliptic. I see. Then the we're, probably, the we're probably formed, you know, when the solar system formed. And then right, right. there's a bunch of them that are just sort of randomly captured. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, those captures happened a long time ago because the solar system had a lot of debris back then. And moons like, and planets like, massive planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune have peered out. Their gravity has peered out the solar system. And so even those captures would have happened early, but not at the time of formation of the solar system. That debris was left over from the formation of the solar system and that the planets are thought to have cleared those out. And I didn't know that they had captured some of those uh, larger particles as moons. It's very interesting. Jupiter's a lot bigger than the Earth is, too. What is a lot bigger? Jupiter's a lot bigger, yes, of course, much more yeah. massive. Yeah. I mean, is there really um, a good way to tell whether or not they were captured a long time ago or, uh, you know, relatively recently? Because um, I guess there might, can, be, there so might be from uh, the chemistry of the surfaces. Because, um, you know, there's a certain amount of chemical enrichment that went on in the solar nebula. Um, and, uh, but, so I don't know. I, they, these are, um, we have a wonderful earth and planetary sciences department at UC Santa Cruz. And some pe people there study these sorts of questions. Um, Hunter, take care, good night. Okay. Uh, Peter, thank you. Thank you, thank you for staying on so late. I know it's very late there. 
I, uh, I don't think this article was meaning to suggest that they were captured from outside the solar system. No, no, but maybe the from the asteroid belt and <laughs> yeah. I, I thought I'd you know I can't find it now, but I, I thought I'd seen something that maybe there was some you know wanderings from like the Jupiter Lagrange points and yes. things like that that maybe you know not all of this was a long time mm -hmm. ago. Yes. It is. You know, some of the most iconic uh, features of the solar system are relatively new, actually. Uh, for example, Saturn's rings, according to some theories, are actually younger than sharks on Earth. So sharks evolved before Saturn's rings were formed. That's crazy. Wow. They're only like a couple hundred million years old or something, or maybe less. Wow. And they're disappearing fast. Um, the ice and dust is falling into the atmosphere of Saturn. So they will be gone someday. Wow. That's fascinating. I saw that also. Yeah. That's amazing. I had no idea. So sharks are, I mean, I'm impressed. Well, sharks, by sharks are old. I hadn't yes, heard the shark but, uh, part, but yeah. But the I I'd heard that the rings some uh, some people think are very relatively recent. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and I think it's sort of like difficult to tell exactly, but you know it's a leading theory. But people who study craters on the moon, for example you can see which craters, you know, obviously if you have a big crater and then something lands on, you know, something, if you have a crater, create, create, you know, every time there's a very big crater, it smooths out that region, right? So the crate counting craters uh, can tell you about the relative, which happened before which, right? So if you have one crater that's sitting on um, the sea of a, another crater, you know that that smaller crater happened after, you know, so uh, I know that that's one method in which they used to at least do relative timings of impact events on the moon. Yeah, and I think it's pretty clear that most of the impacts were more than 4 billion years ago. Most of the giant impacts, yes. Yeah. I have colleagues, even in my department, and certainly in the Earth and Planetary Sciences department, that we can, I can invite them to a Shadow the Scientist session. They can talk about this. Wouldn't that be fun? Instead of having me make up yes. stuff. Yeah. No, I, I like listening to you too. <laughs> You're very interesting to listen to. No, thank you. I will. I, I, I think I should invite some of my planetary scientist friends. They, they, they study these things. You have a very good knack for making me ask questions and go look up things on Google and stuff. <laughs> Google is a wonderful resource. It would not have occurred to me an hour ago to look up the source of Jupiter's moons. Well, uh, yeah. Those questions, I mean, future hope students ask those questions. Um, really, you know, why does the Earth have, what would happen if the Earth had more than one moon? By the way, you can now see the eight detectors very clearly. Uh, this is, uh, these are the CCDs. One, uh, I think they're numbered one, two, three, four at the bottom, five, six, seven, eight at the top. Not, I think I'm certain. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the spectrum of an of a star or galaxy goes across CCDs one and two, sorry, one and five, or two and six, or three and seven, or four and eight. In fact, Oprajit Antara and I, and, and Lara and I were discussing this with uh, someone who's a real expert on how to take these images and remove the Earth's and the Earth's atmospheric signature and instrumental signatures. She works with Python software. She was teaching us how to 
download some of the software and get ready to, um, or she was running some of the software and showing us how it works. And we're getting ready to run it ourselves. So was helping me do that. Um, so we work a lot with computers. Uh, we have to because astronomical data sets are very complex. And so I hope all of you students at Future Hope are um, either are now learning or will soon learn computer programming as a language. Um, you know, you're, you, many of you mentioned that your favorite languages are math and English. And just like you have logic in how you form English sentences, you have logic in how you form math sentences. A computer program is very much like both of those things. There's a very definite logic to how you construct a, an English sentence or a math equation. And computer science follows its own logic, but it's a very logical system. How many of you are learning, have learned computer programming in, in um, among the 25? Are there 25 students today in the classroom? I can't quite tell. At Future Hope, how many students are in the classroom? I'm not sure they know they're muted. No, I think they do because they one person unmutes and then they talk. So they, they have to send a microphone around though. <laughs> How many students in the classroom for Future Hope? I think they have to unmute the microphone and then uh, ask the question. They've been doing that. But it looks like she's talking. Future Hope, you guys, oh, now, now I can, yeah, say that again. Now, now you're unmuted. Hello, sir. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, please. Ask your question, but then answer my question. How many students are in the classroom? It has to be answered by someone holding the microphone. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, for me to understand. Twenty-five. Okay. Um, what was your question? Sorry, I didn't mean to. I want to take an astronomy. So, what streams would I take? Please repeat your question. I couldn't understand. Sorry, I want to take an astronomy. So, what streams would I take? Oh, if you want to take up astronomy, what stream? Uh, you should take up the science stream in school. Uh, there you would study physics, mathematics, English, uh, chemistry, biology, I imagine also. You should take the science stream if you want to study astronomy. Yeah, I did computer science instead of biology. And yeah, I oh. took the science stream and I'm studying astronomy. <laughs> and Antara, uh, did you take the CBSC or a different board? I took the CBSC. Okay, yes. because that's CBSE, um, Jim, and uh, Jim, it stands for Central Board of Secondary Education. It's a school board exam in India. It's not the only school board exam, but I believe Future Hope, you, you also take the Central Board exam, right? CBSE? Class 10? Is that correct for CBSE? Yes, sir. You take CBSE. And then for 11 and 12, it depends on which school you go to, right? Yes. yes. Okay. How many of you are in uh, class 11 now? Any, anyone in the room? Are, are there any class 11 students in the room? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Two? Two of them raised their hands. Oh, you raised your hand. Yeah, if you're in class 11, raise your hand. Anyone in class? Yeah, you have one, one person in class 11. You know, one thing that was explained to me. Yeah. Actually, sitting that side, that's why they're not visible on the camera. Oh, I see. So, there, there are there. Some of them went for uh, football practice. Uh, they have football, so that's why some of them left. Uh, 
total there are 11 of them here. I see, I see. Oh, fantastic. From class 11. Yeah. yeah, it was explained to me that the class 10 students are busy doing exams, so they're not part of this session. And the class yes, 12 students. Uh, uh, class 12 so students. Are also, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Class 12 students are also busy with exam, prep, exam preparation, that is. Um, yes. So, uh, but there are some class 9 students and 8 and so on. Um, class 9 is there. Class 9 is there. Okay, very good. Yeah, so. Um, so what Antara is saying is for your central board exam, you can substitute, did you say um, biology for computer science? Uh, Antara, what did you say? Yes, um, so I think if you take the science stream, you are required to take um, physics, chemistry, and English, but you can choose the other two subjects. So my choices were math and computer science. And I think those are, pretty standard for anyone who doesn't want to do like NEAT or any of the medical school things. So if you take biology, that's more of a um, like medical oriented choice to make. And did you say MATE? M-A-T-E is an exam, right? NEAT, um, N-E-E-T. N-E-E-T, -E I see. Yeah, it's like the entrance exam for medical school. I see. And it's national something entrance test. I forget what the... Yes. Um, I forget what the full form is, but it's like um, the JEE is for engineering. Um, NEET is entrance. like the equivalent. That's, yeah, JEE is joint entrance examination is what it's called. Joint yes. because it's the joint entrance exam for a bunch of colleges. Mm -hmm. But um, Yeah, NEET is a national something entrance test. Test, yeah. I think. Now, um, so I uh, yeah. I just wanted to know that he has to give this exam and then uh, what does he have to do? Means what is the uh, next oh, step? Yeah, so in college, uh, so in in um, in your CBSE class 10 and CBSE class 12 exam, you want to be in the science stream. In college, oh. depending on where you go to college, you have the, you can, you, can, you may be able to take astronomy courses uh, Operajita, you weren't able to do that in St. Xavier's, right? You took physics? Um, no, uh, I did go to St. Xavier's for my undergrad, but um, yeah, astronomy courses are very, very rare in India. So you have to take physics first. Um, and then even for masters, there are very few places to study astronomy, but some places will let you specialize in astronomy as part of your physics MSc. Um, yeah, but right now the focus should be absolutely on picking at least physics and maths. Uh, yeah, and so at I'm actually, two level. So I'm horrified that uh, math is not a requirement for the science stream from what you described, Anthura. Yeah, like I know a lot of people who took um, physical education instead of math because that was an option you could do. Um, but it seems like math is not really a requirement. Um, right. Physics right. and chemistry are the two required science subjects. At least that's how that's how it worked in my I year. Have science without math. I know. Yeah, I and know. It's weird. Math, is, <laughs> math is so much more central to everything in the world than physics or chemistry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess the assumption is that you are taking math until tenth grade at least, but mm. I did not understand it. Yeah, okay, yeah, good, good. I'm not the only one who's been confused about this. I oh. had a, yeah. yeah, I had a rather unorthodox combination of subjects. Uh, oh. I took statistics instead of biology. I see. In, uh, in, oh, I see, we didn't, we didn't have that. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, we, we, we just had to pick between CS and biology, but um, there are quite a few um, alternative subjects that you can sub in. And also, yeah, it was my CBSE for me. Uh, it was uh, uh, the state board for me. Madhumik and Uchu Madhumik. Yes. So if someone has done uh, electrical engineering, so uh, just completely electrical engineering, so is it, how can you then uh, pursue astronomy? Is it possible to pursue astronomy? You can, absolutely. Because um, um, 
I know a lot of people who, um, not a lot, I know people who have moved from an engineering background at an undergraduate level, at a college level, to something yeah. like astronomy, or vice versa, who've taken something like astronomy at the college level and then gone on to studying engineering. So where should they apply it? Um, it depends on where you're if within India. If you're if you're applying to colleges within India, um, certainly the IITs, the ICERs, the regional engineering colleges, these are places where you can study um, engineering. No such. There is only one uh, ISRO there or IISC. Yes, there's IISC. There's um, also um, there's something um, for studying astronomy. Let me tell you one other thing about studying astronomy. I started uh -huh. studying astronomy when I was in college and even yeah. when I was in school. And I started mm -hmm. it on my own. I started mm -hmm. it on my own by picking up books. And today you have so much access. It doesn't need to be books. You see my t-shirt says Khan Academy. Um, you yeah. know, the Khan Academy produces so many videos about so many topics. You can study astronomy um, online. Uh, highly recommend that uh, I highly recommend self learning. It doesn't matter what your college or for example. Yeah, astronomy. How can someone can pursue their career in the astronomy? That is my actual question. Yeah. Suppose you did yeah. in electrical engineering, and after that, how can you pursue using means in professionally or someone in astronomy? Yeah. Is it so possible? Yeah, to pursue a career in astronomy. One of the requirements is um, not a requirement, but um, getting a PhD, getting a doctorate, PhD in astronomy, opens up a lot of uh, opportunities for careers in astronomy, in astronomy research. Now, um, engineering um, can also be used to pursue a, ca a career where you're building, tele building and designing telescopes, like the people who send James Webb Telescope into space. They are engineers. Many of them are engineers. Some of them are astronomers. But <laughs> you can see that an engineering background can really uh, put you in a position where you can be facilitating astronomy by building telescopes and cameras and instruments. Um, Is it possible to apply in the uh, universities in US? Absolutely. It is possible to apply to study these subjects. Um, in the US, there's a lot of flexibility where you can combine an engineering subject. Uh, you can take some engineering courses and some astronomy courses uh, while pursuing an undergraduate degree. So I have to uh, give some examination in these universities? It's not examination based, it's application based. You have to apply. Um, and the examination is the SAT, the uh, Scholastic Aptitude Test, or the Achievement um, uh, Achievement Test, ACTs. Um, and more and more colleges are getting rid of these entrance tests, and they base it on applications, based on your essays, based on that as a recommendation, based on how you do in your school exams. Um, I uh, it's been a long time since I looked into college applications. You can tell that from just from looking at me. It's a long time ago that I applied to college. So uh, I can put you in touch with people who are applying to college now. Um, Antara applied mm -hmm. to college recently, for example. Yeah. Um, it has not been as long a time, I think, for me. Um, but yeah, a lot of, I, I do know that a lot of colleges are, at least for the next couple of years, um, they are making standardized tests optional, partly because of COVID and partly just because it's hard for everyone to be able to access a standardized test and have the same level of preparation and things like that. So some colleges require you to take standardized tests in order to apply, but a lot of them also don't, um, or they're relaxing the restrictions on those things. And yeah. Does that answer your question a little bit? Uh, yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
and Yael, who was here earlier, she's going to be applying to college soon. So she'll be, um, you know, she'll be going through this process as well. Um, answer one question for me, please, for the Future Hope students. Since the class 11 students and class 12 students, um, you are, are you studying at Future Hope uh, even in class 11 and 12? Or are you studying at different schools for 11 and 12? Sir, actually, uh, we do not have affiliation till now. So uh, they give from a different school. I see. I see. Okay. So how come? How come affiliation yeah, class sorry, go 10. Ahead. Okay. So you have affiliation until class 10. So for the students who are in class 11 in the room today, um, give me an example of which school you're studying your class 11 in. No, no, they are studying here, but they are going to give the exam under uh, the different school name. Got you, got you. I see. So you're doing the exam preparation. You're taking your classes at Future Hope. You're doing your exam preparation. Yes. Pre-tests are all here, but then you'll take the exam under the affiliation of another school. Got you. Give me an example of the kinds of uh, of the names of schools that you are that um, your let's say your current class twelve students are going to take their CBSC exam, class 12 CBSC exam under. Is Diocesan School one of them? Because I know it's located very close to you. Diocesan? Yeah. No. Diocesan no, used no. to be on Elgin Road and uh, Lansdowne Road, very close to where you're located. Maybe they've moved. No, no sir. Uh, they have their own uh, affiliation. So, so which schools are they affiliated with? Your class 12 classmates or your class 12 um, schoolmates? Uh, sir, I specifically don't know the names. Uh, uh, so it's under the authority. I see, of, of different schools, I see. They're not all taking the exam with the same school, right? They're different students are going to different schools. For the exam. No, they are from the same school. If they are affiliated, uh, means they are under one school only. All of them will go under one school. Oh, one school. And, I see. I see. I see. Uh, and uh, they'll go and give the exam because uh, uh, in CBSC we have uh, centers for the exam. We go and give the exam somewhere else. I see. It's That's what you mean. Examination. So it's only so, for the giving of the exam that you'll go to a different school campus for all yes. preparation and pre-test will be at future hope okay yes for all and uh, 10 we have affiliation now so 10 is going to give from our own school and likewise they'll move on means 11 and 12 by two years we'll be able to have our own affiliation got you so yeah given that a test is a very stressful experience um, it'll be good when your school gets the affiliation and you, you know, it's like playing a sport on, on your home ground versus on your, um, on your rival team's, um, you know, field or campus. Uh, taking, test taking is like that. You know, it's uh, when, you're, when you're on your home ground, you feel more confident and you feel like you know everything. Um, you know the environment that gives you a sense of confidence. I'm sure you'll all do very well in the exam, no matter what. Yeah, all very bright. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, we have our lunch time now. Yes, so, you should head out. Yes, exactly. Well, future hope. I will see you again tomorrow night, hopefully. Um, yes, yes. You will see us tomorrow. Bye, 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 that's really cool. I was looking them up online. Yeah, they're a remarkable organization. They've been around for 35 years. Um, I was only recently introduced to the CEO of the uh, of the school, uh, Sujata Sen, and I'm so grateful for this connection.
Uh, I was visiting India, Jim. I was visiting India in August. In fact, I met Aprajita in person in, in Kolkata. They're based in Kolkata. CCD readout. Complete. Yeah, I, I found that. And they have four, my understanding is they have four homes uh, where the children are, those are the residential units. And uh, they all attend this one school. Um, and uh, remarkable, started in 1987. I left India yep. in 85. And, um, but I-, I That's I where you to, grew up? I grew up in Calcutta, yes. I grew up in Calcutta and I, uh, on this visit, I, I was going to various cities in India, including Kolkata. To uh, Calcutta's name is now changed to Kolkata. Uh, and I was, I was with the UCSC admissions team and I was visiting different cities and uh, we were all, and we were attending a conference that has to do with college admissions and um, school counseling. And um, we went to the American Center in Kolkata, which is um, every, every major city has something called the American Center where the students who are applying to US colleges apply through those um, organizations. I did that back in 1985. Readout um, complete. So they, it's sort of a, a, a repository of information and guidance for general guidance for uh, students who are interested in applying to U.S. colleges at the undergraduate or graduate level. Um, so I've gone there to talk to students as part of our visit to spread the word about Santa Cruz, but also um, um, talk about resources like these, like Child of the Scientists that we could bring to students. And two of the teachers said that, you know, in addition to the students who come to the center, we've been affiliated with Future Hope in the past. And it's a remarkable organization because, I mean, the children who come to the school are the poorest of the poor. Um, many. Of, I was gathering that from, yeah. from what I saw on the web. Yeah. yeah. And um, it looks like they're doing really well. They're doing fantastic. I mean, I think kudos to the school, kudos to the students. Um, yeah. They're amazing, amazing group. Um, you should show them your artwork. I bet they would get a kick out of that. I did that a couple of nights ago, and that completely derailed did the you? conversation. Good. <laughs> because they were, uh, yeah, we, I don't know how, what led to what, but we, uh, it's not difficult to get me talking about my art. It's difficult to stop me from talking about my art. So now we had a good conversation. I think it was, might have been two nights ago. This is the fourth night in a row that they've connected. I, I guess I... You know, I didn't even realize that it started. So, yeah, I, I, I guess I knew it was last night, but I, I guess it started earlier. You're doing so many of them. Yeah, I'm not going to so, be able to come every night, but you know, September we're doing <laughs> uh, doing twenty of these, you know, two a night. Um, yeah, so I, I'm like, I, I can't do that, but I'll, 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 I'll come to yeah. some of them. Yeah, drop in whenever you can. That's good. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, I always get something out of it. Um, good. Oh, that's good. Very, very interesting. And it, it reminds me of when I was a student, which yeah. is a long, like you, it's a long time ago. I think almost yeah. about the same amount of time. Yeah, me too. It does remind um, me when I was a student. And, um, and you know, we have two other uh, people on the call who are, uh, who've been doing research with me, uh, Antara uh, and uh, Aparajito. So we were just having a research meeting right before um, before Child of the Sun, tonight Child of the Scientist session. So that was, it's been, uh, it's, it's also very good for them, for the, to have this sort of range of students in the, in the call, a uh, range, range of people, not just students who are at different stages of their academic journey. It's so, um, it creates a, it creates a path. Um, people to see, the young people to see. So I think that's... Um, um, yeah. Well, when, when they were saying that it was lunchtime, I was just about to say I needed to, I'm about to fall asleep myself. <laughs> so... <laughs> Jim, it's good to see you. Always good. Always good to so, see you. Yeah. And, you know, I've still got Kiva in the background, but it's becoming further and further from the front lines, which is... Which is good. Which is very nice. Which is <laughs> when, we, when we first did, when I first got on one of these sessions, I think the Russians were right outside of town. And yeah. 
now I think they're a couple hundred kilometers away or maybe even further. So yeah. that's Russia's the big going, trend. Russia, uh, Putin's putting Russia in a crisis now by conscripting yeah. billions. So I think that's going yep. to rapidly uh, erode his popularity, if there was any. Yeah, I think so. That's a, you know, it is still a scary situation. Yeah, very, very. I mean, you know, they, they yeah. do theoretically have nuclear weapons, although one wonders how well they work. Yeah. Well, a malfunctioning nuclear weapon is probably more dangerous than one that works well. It depends on what the malfunction is. Yeah, I know. I know. That's true. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's scary. I, I just finished reading a, a three volume uh, book set of the history of the Pacific War, a, a new one, which had a lot of new stuff that I didn't know about. But, uh, you know, reading the descriptions of Hiroshima and Nagasaki again, and, you know. No, wow. that, is a, that is one place uh, I recommend to everyone. I've, I've visited Hiroshima three times. Um, I've visited the museum yeah. in Hiroshima three times. And um, I just recommend that to everyone. It is, um, there's nothing short of a life changing. I've never been to Japan. It was nothing short I've of a I've never life. been for. Yeah. It, you know, it's life changing. Absolutely, Jamino. It was life changing. The first time I went, I went with a few astronomy colleagues. We'd gone to a conference in Kyoto. The second time I took my family there, I said, you know, I've been to this, you have to come see this. And the third time there was a conference in Hiroshima. But each time, uh, it's just, um, I don't know, it's so important. It's so important to... I can imagine. You know, to experience, to see and experience this. And I don't just mean Hiroshima, but um, I, you know, going to the 9-11 memorial, um, going to a Holocaust museum. These are all things that yeah. are important for us, um, for everyone to do, because um, it just slightly decreases the chance that you'll get involved in making those sorts of decisions or mistakes. Um, slightly. Uh, a decade ago, my wife and I went to Monticello, Jefferson's uh -huh. home. Jefferson. Which you wouldn't think would fall into the category of the kind of places you're talking about. No, I know exactly what you mean. That, that exactly really struck me uh -huh. was how it was so centered on slavery. Yes, yes, and um, um, I know exactly I know what it was. It was yeah, uh, he is celebrated, but um, also um, it is very much about the treatment of slaves. Uh, I went to the African American Museum of History and uh, the, Af the African American Museum of History and Culture. It was, I think, it was inaugurated by Barack Obama. Uh, I went there just before the pandemic hit. Again, life changing uh, or perspective changing, certainly. Um, yeah. I'm working uh, more and more with indigenous groups in. In the in the North America and including Hawaii, um, more and more in Africa, and that has also been perspective um, changing for me. It's um, you know one of the very cool things about Chat of the Scientists is we Antara, Oprajito, you Jim, and the Future Hope students will be contacted by someone named Hillary Davis, who's been employed through a grant we just got to evaluate the impact of Shadow the Scientists, not just on the non-scientists who participate, but on the scientists who host these sessions. What, what impact this is having on me um, is quite profound. Um, what I'm learning from the questions, what I'm learning from people's reactions is quite profound. So they, she's going to, Hillary is going to evaluate the impact of this activity on hosts and participants. So I'll get an email from her? You'll get an email from her. And, you know, um, the way I'll, these things are probably a questionnaire, questionnaire, probably. Um, what we make okay. available to her are the people um, who have signed up through the Google form and also people who have shown up on the Zoom calls. And so um, it's optional. You don't have to answer them, but this is her. She's going to write a paper 
on um, how activities like these can affect STEM identity, STEM learning um, in both posts. I'll watch for that. Yeah, please, please do, okay. Um, Hillary with a single L and A-R-I-E instead of the usual spelling uh, and Davis. Okay. Um, yeah, we, you know, we are still in the early stages. The project, this, this part of the project, this funded part with her evaluation started on August 1st, so it hasn't even been two months. But um, so she's going to do these as qu uh, retrospective questions, meaning she's going to ask you, Jim, how did you feel about observing? And, you know, you, of course, are very closely connected to uh, observing as an amateur astronomer, but you might ask questions about how did you feel about the universe, et cetera, before you took part, and how do you feel after, and how many times do you take part, those sorts of questions. And she's going to aggregate this information. She's not going to be identifying the respondents, obviously, but she's going to be identifying. And she'll ask other questions about level of education, your connection to astronomy. And this is it's a proper scientific study in the field of science education and science learning. Um, not my area of expertise, but you know, Hillary has published papers in this area. And so we're looking forward to that. I, you know, I've been putting amateur astronomer on the forms, but I haven't done any observations since I was in college. I mean, <laughs> basically, I did some astronomy labs when I was in college. And I've always been, you know, like you, I've always been a self learner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, starting in like fourth grade, I, you know, read voraciously. And a lot of that was astronomy. Uh -huh. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not really an amateur astronomer. Um, other than I read a lot, and I'm fascinated by it. But, you know, I, I don't go out and do, you know, stay up all night and <laughs> stuff like that anymore. <laughs> yeah, so um, one of the one of the really cool things about when, you know, when we wrote this proposal to get money, um, uh, I came up with a name. And uh, it's before Shadow the Scientist, the funded portion is called Lenses and Mirrors. And of course, you know, at a telescope, you use lenses and mirrors. But it's really used figuratively. Right. Because here the kids are looking through a scientist lens at the universe, or every, you know, uh, the participants right. or non scientists are looking through a scientist lens. But it's a mirror in the sense that it it does change your perception of yourself. It changes you when you go through these experiences. So in that sense, it's a mirror. Um, so I I I am very fond of this uh, contribution to this project is coming up with this name, Lenses and Mirrors. So you'll probably see it say that, Lenses and Mirrors dash Shadow the Scientist. Oh, I like that. And I don't know, it kind of makes me think of, uh, isn't there a Shadows and Mirrors? Isn't that a saying? That's for there spies. Is, there, that's right, that's right. Shadows and Mirrors, that's right. There's something about that, you know. It's about it's subterfuge and trickery, right? Isn't it smokes and mirrors? Smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Smoke That's and it. Mirrors. Yeah. That's exactly Smoke right. and mirrors. We got lenses and mirrors. So the smoke obscures, but the lenses make make things clearer. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Gravitation lenses distort, of course. But um, no, <laughs> it's, um, it's really been a fun journey. We started this uh, two years ago. The concept of Shadow the Scientist started in on November 6th, 2020. And we just invited a small group of friends to say, you know, we're going to be observing. Do you want to come and watch it? It was a simple experiment. And then it really took off in February of 21. Was that in person? No, it was during the pandemic. So November 2020, it was, in fact, it was done because of the pandemic. You said the, 2019, that's before oh, the that's, pandemic. No, 2020 it started in November 2020, two years ago. Um, so, it, oh, okay. In fact, it started because of the pandemic. So, what happened was um, because the telescope, uh, or the observatories became COVID bubbles, so you couldn't go up there to use the telescope. Right. And the observatory, uh, the university. Right. And now, you, university, now you're not doing. Yeah. Yeah, universities closed because you couldn't go there to use the telescope. You know, remote observing rooms you couldn't use. So they enabled our computers at home, laptops, so we can use. Um, remote telescopes from home. The moment that happened, we said, okay, this is so much fun. We're going to do this from home. Just join us on Zoom. It was sort of, it started like that. And, um, and in February of 21, 
we said, let's just do this systematically. Let's reach out to groups. Let's work with, um, like that's when I connected with Pran. Um, uh, shortly after that, uh, I connected with um, uh, various indigenous groups. I worked with something, uh, an organization called Native Sky Watchers, started by Professor Annette Lee. Um, so various organizations um, became partners. Uh, Antara's dad runs an organization in Mumbai. That's a partner of Shadow the Scientists. Um, it's, uh, it's called the Center for Science Education. Um, to me, the way communities are now forming, you know, around the world is the one really bright spot about the pandemic. It and is. I feel like way more connected in in my communities, mostly professional, but um, this you know is also sort of I, I lump in in the same thing because I you know I'm now every month I'm I'm in about seven or eight zooms and <laughs> you know I have but they're all you know they're not it's not work things I I, I work by myself I'm an independent software developer. And so actually that's always been kind of isolating. I've worked at home for 20 years. I see, I see. And had no had no water cooler, right? And could <laughs> yeah. only, you know, meet people in a very limited, you know, that if they happen to live in the Los Angeles area. And even there, you know, if you're on the other side of the Los Angeles area, you might as well be on the moon. It's a three hour drive. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and now, you know, I've I've got, you know, new friends that I consider pretty good friends at this point in Vancouver, in New Zealand, in Boston, in Austin, in Cleveland, Denmark, that I meet up with every month. That's fantastic. And it's, it really is, you know, I, I, I feel color. like this is in some ways a golden age, you know, it's like, in, in that sense, I'm, you know, and, and people that are interested in the same things that I'm interested in. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's fantastic. You know, my wife's sort of like, what are you doing on Zoom all the time? <laughs> um, Jim, I, there are days, uh, there are days when I have a dozen Zoom calls, um, you know, just work. Uh, you know, I'm sure that, 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 that you know, I think I, that's old. I'm glad I don't have, you know, like, I think, you know, I, you know, I didn't have meetings before. I still don't as far as, you know, I don't have to have meetings as part of a job or anything. I'm glad for that, you know, but, but these other things are all, they're all, you know, variations on this where we want to get together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> and, you know, we're not sitting around listening to a PowerPoint or something where, yeah. you know, sharing, um, sharing, you know, with us, with, the, with, with each other. So, yeah, it's it's pretty neat. <clears throat> and yeah, look, here, here's um, kids in India, and you know, hopefully, uh, you know, all this is going to make the world even a little bit more smaller. Not that that's, I, I remember in the '80s, and all the people in the computer business were, you know, oh, computers are going to bring us all together. Hmm. And they have, but I think they thought that was going to make the problems go away. <laughs> and, mm. you know, no, there's no salvation in that. No, um, they're still fighting people, wars. People, no. bring, pe people bring their, their problems wherever they go and whatever, you know. True. But, um, you know, yeah, in fact, in a lot of ways now, it seems like you know, this is a this is a really scary time in history. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, the 1930s and those problems are, are, are those coming back again? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Um but um I, yeah and hopefully it can't be bad for people to uh to meet up with each other from from all over the place. Yeah, it is. It's really wonderful to be connected. I, um, the this is the irony. I lived a few minutes away 
from Future Hope when I was growing up in Kolkata. Of course, the school didn't exist then when I was living in that part. But I've still yeah. gone back to Kolkata many times. And um, because they're not on a main street, because you know, they're a relatively small school, you know, it's not a private school, I hadn't heard of them. And how remarkable. These kids are so, so remarkable that um, it was entirely my loss that I, I hadn't connected with them. And it just, just happened by chance on a dime. Uh, it just happened. And all it took was, you know, one Zoom call with the director. And I think in, in an instant, there was a sense of trust that, um, that we were going to bring value to each other. Right? And that, um, it's it's quite remarkable. It's really quite remarkable. And I think I saw it. it's pretty small, right? It's only a few hundred students. I think it's a few hundred students, and they go from kindergarten to grade twelve. So I mean, it's not really surprising that you would not. No. You know, I mean, Calcutta is a big place. It's uh, a big place, and there are many big name schools. Uh, the good yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So you know. it's easy to miss. You know, and, and the kids, you know how they said, uh, you know, many of the kids are playing football. You know, they meant soccer. And um, they're right, very good at football. Very good. They're very good at rowing, a crew. They're very good at rugby, basketball. In fact, they thrash my alma mater in these sports, right? So um, they were, they're so... Um, Your alma mater at Calcutta? In Calcutta, yeah, my high school, which is a... You know, it's a very old high school. That one goes back to 1836. But um, wow, that is old. That is old. Yeah, it was set up when India was part of the British Empire. Um, well before, I mean, more than 100 years before India, India became independent in 1947. So this was 100. My high years. school only went back to 1898. That's still old. That's very old. <laughs> Which is still pretty old. Yeah. <laughs> very old. Um, yeah. Especially in Southern California. Yeah, no, no, no. That's uh, 1898. You said that's 49 years after the gold rush. Well, yeah, but this is Southern California. True, true. So that was, this is in Orange County. I see. So yeah, the gold rush. I think thing. it's the, you know, one of the first 10 schools in Orange County. Wow. I guess the missions were built from the south up. Yes. San Diego. But that's early. way earlier. That's, way that's, that's, way that's way another 150, exactly. 150 years earlier. Exactly, exactly. And they don't really have much connection with um, I mean, any, you know. When was the end of the Mexican-American War? Would that, would, that would have been in the early 1800s? Um, 1849, I think. I was going the, the missions were, yeah, that you're right. Um, maybe the 1840s. Was, 18, oh, that late. Okay. Okay. The missions it, were it was set up well it, before it, that. It, yeah. The, the missions petered out earlier than that. Yeah. The, the, the missions started around 1750, 1760. Mm -hmm. um, see, being in California, that was like, you know, we had to study the missions. Yeah. So that's, why I know, you know, fourth grade is like you had to, everybody had to build, you know, we had to build a mission out of paper mache and stuff. It, <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they, they started, I think San Diego was the first one and gradually, you know, I think the San Francisco,